Welcome, everybody. Um, thank you for coming here tonight. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the Audain Distinguished Artist um, in Residence program. Um, it was funded by Michael Audain and the Audain Foundation for the Visual Arts. Uh, and it enables the university to bring the world's leading contemporary artists to live and work in Vancouver for one to three month um, periods. Guest artists and visiting lecturers are an integral part of the Emily Carr community. They complement students' education and they work with existing faculty, bringing new opportunities for collaboration and engagement. Lucy Scare uh, joins the Emily Carr community as the fall 2015 Audain Distinguished Artist in Residence. Lucy Scare completed her BA at the Glasgow School of Art. In 1997, Lucy co-founded the collaborative group Henry VIII's Wives. In 2003, she was shortlisted for the Beck's Futures Prize and exhibited at the first Scottish presentation at the Venice Biennale, where she also presented in 2007. Lucy's solo presentations include the Chisholm Gallery London, Kunsthal Basel, for which she was nominated for the Turner Prize, uh, Kunsthal Vienne, Yale Union Portland, and Tramway Glasgow. She has had solo shows at Murray Guy and Peter Freeman, both in New York, and at the Gallo Roman Museum in Lyon. Lucy collaborates with Rosalind Nashashibi, and they are currently working on a new film together, which will premiere at Tate St. Ives next year. After the talk, there will be a brief uh, Q&A, and then um, please join us at the Charles H. Scott Gallery for a reception after the talk. Um, please join me in welcoming Lucy Scare. Hello, great. Um, thanks everyone for coming. Thanks for the introduction. And um, thanks to the Ordains for supporting me being here. It's fantastic to, uh, to be here. So I've just arrived, but I'm looking forward to my time here. Um, okay, um, I'm going to talk a bit about, um, about my work but I'm going to address it kind of from the point of view of a question that I got at the end of a talk that I gave about two years ago that I sort of um, tried to dodge. <coughs> so that question was um, why so much of my work appears anachronistic or if um, I have a particular interest in things misplaced in time. Um, and it's true, I do. Um, I'm quite often like really drawn to very ancient objects, particularly if they've somehow lost their context or their story, which most ancient things have. Um, and I'm also interested in, in my own kind of um, process in starting from a point of um, a fact or um, a material or uh, a piece of research and moving away from that towards abstraction. So I see those, those things as kind of linked in some way. Um, I guess what I wanted to do is unpack the idea of, of prehistory a little bit, um, and particularly in terms of British modernism um, which I guess is my perspective, and it's quite a British perspective talk, I guess, <laughs> so forgive me for that. Um, uh, the, the idea of prehistory is quite recent. It's the kind of um, time before written history began. Um, and the word was first used in 1836. The Hunterian Museum, which is a museum in Glasgow, has got a tooth and tusk of a mastodon, which is like an early elephant, um, the, at the time that it was collected in Ohio was kind of um, believed to be a beast that was still alive but very distant probably in some land that at the time was not discovered. Um, later on that uh, same tooth and tusk were interpreted as being distant in time so the kind of perspective changed and I think a lot of the, um, the kind of uh, romanticism and exoticism of place switched to being a romanticism and exoticism of time um, when the period of, of the world kind of changed from being 6,000 years old to being 4.5 billion years old. <clears throat> 
And I think that, I mean, that, that change happened in the kind of 1830s and then through Darwin in kind of 1850s, 60s, I think I've got, I think it's around then. Um, and I think it had a really profound um, influence on British modernism um, in, in parallel with industrialization. But the idea that, that your kind of chronology had been so hugely um, wrong in its scale. Um, I think it produced a lot of trauma and a lot of anxiety in the generations that followed. So you see it in writing of Virginia Woolf, um, to whom prehistory really appealed as time without narrative. And she described her novel, The Waves, um, which is probably the, the book that I think most relates to prehistory. Because when the opening passages of it, it starts um, as if she's writing the world from the very beginning. She describes the sun rising over the ocean and the way that the light reacts on to the waves. And then she, she starts with the narrative of different children. Um, and each of them sort of speak as if they're discovering language for the first time as they describe this dawn. <clears throat> she referred to it as that mystic eyeless book, which I like. Um, so she talks about the waves um, in, in a kind of margin note in an early draft. Um, she says, I'm not concerned with the single life, but with lives together. I'm trying to find in the folds of the past such fragments as time preserves. There was a napkin, a flower pot, and a book. I'm telling the story of the world from the beginning and in a small room whose windows are open. This is a painting by Paul Nash, um, who's a British uh, modernist painter, um, and he did a lot of kind of book design and other design as well. Um, it's called Equivalence to the Megaliths. Um, Paul Nash is an artist that I'm sort of a little bit obsessed with. Um, I've made a few different works that refer to his works. And I think this is a really interesting move that he's, that he's making here, um, where he's substituting these kind of abstract forms um, in probably the Wiltshire landscape in, in the UK, where there are a lot of standing stones and um, stone henges there, and there are lots of different um, kind of uh, prehistoric monuments. And I think that's probably Silbury Hill, which is a big man-made hill from that period in the background. Um, <clears throat> But I think it's, it's an interesting move that he uh, doesn't take the form of the megaliths or the substance of the megaliths. He just takes the, the context of them and the kind of legitimacy that their prehistoric um, date gives him to reinvent. So, okay, that bit done with. Um, <laughs> I'm going to talk about a few different projects, starting with um, probably the, the first work that I made in what I think of as my current kind of practice. Um, it began with a work um, where I went to visit the artist Leonora Carrington, who was living in Mexico City. And Leonora really interested me because um, because she was alive at the same time that I was alive, which seemed really actually strange. <coughs> so Leonora was born in 1916. Um, she um, was meant to be a, a British debutante and be kind of uh, of the high societies. Um, but instead she ran off with Max Ernst and um, moved to Paris. And so she was with Max Ernst um, when war broke out and he was interned as a German living in France. And she had a breakdown and moved to Spain and then moved to New York where she knew a lot of the Dada 
artist, artists at the time. And then she moved to Mexico City, and then she just lived in Mexico City. So she had this kind of, um, I mean, she was basically a, a surrealist um, in, <laughs> uh, in the kind of epoch that she, that she lived in. And it seemed strange that I could meet one of those actual surrealists now. So I went to Mexico City and I made a short film, which is just, it's like three and a half minutes long, the length of a, of a film reel. Um, and it's her in her studio and she basically, I just, the only thing I asked her to do was hold her hands as if she was about to do something. And I wanted her presence um, in my own practice in order to kind of um, use her almost like a joker or a wild card <coughs> to disassemble, disassemble the, the logic of what I've been doing before. So um, while I felt like I couldn't step off completely from a reference point myself, I tried to use her um, to legitimize that step. So I made an installation of quite loosely related things. Um, that uh, an inlaid table, the big curved drawing is a drawing of a whale that's made in a very particular tiny array of marks. It's a whale skeleton, I should say. Um, there's the table. I made this um, kind of sculpture that's from um, images of riots. So the one that you see there is, um, I think, Kent State riot. Um, and I've kind of just rotated them to be three-dimensional objects from flat images. Here's a close-up of the, of the head of the whale. Um, so it's almost like the, the whale is embedded in the drawing. It looks a bit like some kind of um, writing gone, gone awry. So that was that project. And, um, While I used her presence, Leonora's presence, um, to animate and legitimate that series of, of objects, um, I took that idea forward in this project, um, which is based on The Ship of Fools by Sebastian Brandt, which um, is a kind of parable about, um, obviously, a bunch of fools in a boat um, they don't know where they're going, but they're sailing towards a kind of fictional place called Narragonia, um, which is kind of like a fool's utopia. Um, but all of them have a different idea of where it is that they're going, and um, they never get there. Um, it's also weirdly the first um, um, textual reference to the discovery of the new world, which is a kind of interesting slant on it. Um, but anyway, it's in, um, it's in K21 in Dusseldorf, and uh, kind of due to them not having any money to ship anything, I made the work by cutting it, cutting this woodcut, which is the frontispiece of the book, into their floor. Um, and then, so, um, then inking it up and making a, a print from it. Um, So a ship should also have ballast, and for my ballast, and also kind of as my protagonists, I had these um, sculptures by, uh, copies of sculptures by Brancusi. Um, the sculpture's called The Newborn, and um, Brancusi made it at a time that he was trying to deny that he had um, fathered a child. Um, but I think what's interesting about them to me um, is the way that they kind of flip between being an image of something and being just a kind of dead weight. I think Bryony Fur re referred to them as part screaming child and part ball bearing. And it's quite an interesting kind of um, line, I think. Uh, so anyway, they were my, my ballast and my protagonist. I'm interested in ballast as a thing anyway because it's, it is just matter, but matter that has agency. And that's quite an odd um, category. 
Anyway, here they are. So after that show was done, um, I wanted to extend the, the kind of narrative nature of the work um, in that the ship traveled, it, it, it moved around, um, and it moved further into kind of um, nonsensical realms, I guess. So um, I wanted to really inhabit this reference of the fall to make more work and to try to make um, foolish work. So I pulled up the floor, um, stuck it all back together, and then the next time it was shown, it was scrambled um, slightly. It's not like majorly scrambled because all the pieces are still the right way up and you can still read it as, a, as an image. Um, but each time it was subsequently shown, it got more and more scrambled. And each time a print was made. So there's the print. And this is in a gallery, this is the same work um, in a gallery called Tulips and Roses. Well, that was, that was in Tulips and Roses as well. Um, so this is the kind of second iteration of it. And one thing that I thought would please a, a fool um, or was an easy solution is, is to have things that match. So the Brancusi heads that you saw before um, have now been recast into these kind of pillars that are extrusions of the tiled floor. So they just mimic um, the shape and they come up from the floor in the shape that the tiles dictate. And there's something very kind of easy and, and pleasing about this way of matching things. Um, it's almost like your, your mind or your eyes is um, conditioned to see symmetry or see um, similitude in a way that overrides a lot of other things. So it overrides um, maybe narrative or history. Um, it's almost like a kind of hardwired thing. So there's the, there's the ballast. And then we made sails along the same kind of um, guideline of matching. And I made these series of sculptures that are also in the show that's called Liquidity in the Mind of the Fool. And it's about um, how the how the fool would look at the water and also um, how financial liquidity works in some way. So the, the books are, um, are the history of money and I've cut through them and um, the shape in the middle is, is just a, um, an enamel blank, the same size as the book. And then I've melted tin and poured it through in this kind of wave-like shiny, precious, honest <laughs> um, way. And all of these objects that I made now, I, these ones I'm trying to make from the perspective of, of in a kind of lumpen and ugly way, but in a way that's sort of maybe eye-catching or, um, or magpie-like. Uh, so these, these, this is a kind of lozenge or a nugget that's made out of misstamped coins. Um, so they're, they're basically, you can buy them on eBay, they're, there's a whole transaction going on about these uh, misminted coins. Um, and I'm interested in them partly because they just went wrong um, and they haven't, they're, they're, they're failed. Um, and partly because they're like right midway, this kind of um, representation or um, token of something else and just a bit of metal. Um, this one also relates to money in some way um, with the cowrie shells, um, but it also has these miniature bronze little brancusis inside, brancusi newborns inside it. Um, and I, I, I guess I kind of made a 
um, a history of what the transformation of the project had been to that point in these very kind of crude sculptures. So, um, so this is the this is to do with the melting down and the and the changing of these Brancusi heads, but it's also to do with the kind of potential um, upending of the of the boat and um, ensuing disaster. And they're made with quite almost like medieval type materials, so um, with enamel and colored glass and um, this one has rock crystals in it. This one's really ugly. It's got um, these fossils called devil's toenails and, um, and melted marbles. Anyway, so that was that, that project. It went through another few iterations, but I won't go on. <laughs> um, so this, this um, strategy of like adopting a position that's not mine is one that I've done a few times in, in different projects. And of course it is partly mine, but I'm imagining an exterior um, position or reference for myself to try to think from. This project is called Film for an Abandoned Projector. And um, it is exactly what it says. It's, it's a film that I've made for a specific projector. So the projector could have been anywhere. It could have been abandoned um, in storage or, um, or wherever. Um, but in fact, obviously it was in an old cinema because the 35 millimeter projectors were so heavy and cumbersome that um, really often um, they were just boarded into the projection rooms and then the cinemas went on to be um, repurposed for something else. This one had been a light bulb factory and then it had been um, a church. Well, it was currently a church. So um, what we did is refurbish the projectors and I actually found the, the original projectionist from this um, um, cinema, which was a bit of a mis mixed blessing. He was a funny guy. Um, but he then projected the film that I made. So we cut, this is the view of where the beam of the projector should exit the, the room into the cinema. And then this is the film. Um, on the screen you can see the cinema, but you can't, you can't see that, can you? No. <laughs> you can maybe see it in that one a bit better. Yeah. So um, I made the, a film that was really kind of obsessed with the physical nature of the world because I imagined that the projector would have only seen these kind of transient fleeting things. Um, so the film, because it was made for that place, it only ever would play in that place. So um, after the show, I... Uh, removed all of the pictures from the film with this kind of custom made punch thing that I got made. Um, and it now basically only has the margin of the, of the film visible. So the first one that you saw there was um, was the the print punched out, which leaves a white hole in the middle of the film, and this one is the negative punched out, which obviously leaves a black hole.
So um, then I had a lot of film frames um, to deal with. So yeah, I did a lot of kind of recycling and rehashing, don't like any waste. Um, this, this is a, a work that I made at Yale Union um, in Portland that uh, it's basically, it's a bit like a fake amber or something. It's, um, it's gum rosin, which is a natural resin from a tree. Maybe you actually make it here, I, I wonder. Um, but we got it from Brazil and um, it's used in chewing gum and leg wax and um, various different products. But it is, it, it's kind of meltable and um, settable. So the film frames are all suspended in this resin. Um, and the resin itself is uh, fitted, cast into a gap in the wall. So I'm going to talk about um, this work, which this is, the, this is the flyer for the show. Um, the show is called The Siege, and it's a work that I made at the Chisholm Hill Gallery. Um, and it was perhaps like the, the first work that I, that I made that I felt um, able to completely um, plunder art history in a way that, I mean, I don't really mean art history, I mean actual other artists' works and historic works, um, in a way that I could repurpose them and perhaps just plain use them. Um, so when, when I want to use another artist's work, it's not, a, I don't see it as a appropriation, which maybe has more to do with um, identity, I see it as, um, as a kind of openness to the functionality of, of artworks and what they can, what they can do. And also um, a feeling that you can address the past in a completely straightforward way. Um, almost like when I went to visit Leonora, I felt that was it was legitimate of me to ask her because she was an artist and I was an artist and there was that connection there, I, I hoped. Um, so I suppose I have made a number of works that I've tried just to straightforwardly um, pick up someone else's project. And it's funny because I think, um, I think that approach comes a bit from um, my history of collaborating a lot with other artists that um, almost when I started working with Rosalind Nashashibi, who I'm making the film with at the moment, I was just like, oh great, now I can like add her brain to, to mine, but not like I can ask her what she thinks all the time. I, I just mean that I can um, add it almost like you would kind of plug in a hard drive into a computer, I was like, okay, now I can think through all of her concerns <laughs> as well as my own. So it was a kind of um, allowing oneself to do that and allowing someone else to do that with you. Um, and I think it's kind of bled into lots of different uh, <laughs> artists that I use their work without their permission. Anyway. <laughs> So the work's called The Siege, and the basic structure of the exhibition is, um, is a room which is divided by a wall. So the flyer is also kind of divided in half, and there's, yeah, you can see it. Um, so this is the wall, which is a big curved wall. And on the inside of the wall, um, these slides flick between two different venues, so um, forgive the floor changing, but it's the same, same work. Um, so basically, like the siege as a scenario interested me because um, it, has, it has a certain amount of matter inside it, and that amount of matter 
fuel, food, whatever, relates to time in a really direct way in a siege. Um, and also I imagined in a siege that um, everything would be repurposed or repurposable if you'd suddenly run out of, um, of fuel, you would burn the furniture, for example, or you would use it as a barricade or whatever. It would be a kind of um, period in which everything was rethinkable. I mean, a, a disastrous scenario, but... Um, And I wanted this show to be a bit like, um, a bit you, like you just walked into an image and you're walking around in the image. Um, th these are tables that print zeros. Um, and I thought of them as kind of a countdown kind of timeline. So zero, 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 zero. Um, and I made these sculptures, um, which are copies of Brancusi's Bird in Space. And um, in my work, this piece is called Black Alphabet. And Brancusi made 26 um, different birds, of birds in space during his lifetime. Mine are all made out of coal, so they have like a kind of, again, like a feeling of being part, um, part maybe weapons or um, fuel or also part protagonist. This, um, this screen is taken from one of Paul Nash's paintings, um, Landscape from a Dream. Um, and he's painted a kind of screen. There's a, I think there's like a falcon it's quite a bad painting, actually. It's a falcon, and you see the sea through the screen, um, and it's it's kind of transformed in a way. But he's painted the screen in a very quick um, series of brush strokes, and the geometry doesn't make any sense. So we made this kind of non-geometric structure after his brush strokes, so one of them continues on beyond the vertical, so blah, blah, you get it. Um, Okay, so this is um, this is a bit of an aside, um, but I think it's it's kind of interesting, and I wanted to put it in because I think it relates to the way that I later reassembled that installation, the siege, into a, another work, um, which refers more directly to to printing. Um, so this is uh, an etching. Um, which is um, by Peter Sendradam, um, which is um, an etching to refute the rumors of the appearance of an image in an apple tree. So um, there was, it's Dutch, it's from... Um, Okay, I've lost when it's from. I think it's like 17th century. Um, and uh, basically there was an apple tree that was cut down and in the apple tree there appeared um, an image of, of a monk or a nun. Um, and there was an etching that was made um, which was um, advertising the fact that this religious figure had appeared in a rotten tree stump. Um, and so this image was made to refute that image. Um, so this yeah. image here is at the top, you see the, I think that's the, um, the monk or the nun in various different poses. Um, and then he's showing how it doesn't resemble this rot in the apple tree. Um, and at the time, a bit of small backstory, um, Holland was Protestant and there was, it was at war with Spain and there was a fear that, um, that it was going to, that Spain were going to 
um, reconquer the area and reintroduce Catholicism. So this apple tree stump was interpreted as an omen in the first print um, of the coming of, of Catholics back to the area. And in the second print, in a very kind of Protestant manner, um, it's, it's refuted. Um, so this, th these prints have been talked about um, uh, by Svetlana Alpers um, mainly and also um, by a number of other people. Uh, one is Todd P. Olson, who I'm going to quote a little bit from. Um, the point at which this print is made is seen as a kind of turning point between the way that images were, were understood. Um, so I'm going to read a little quote from what he says. So he's talking about, um, about semiotics in France in the 17th century as an example. It says, um, shape, color, and size, and scent are banished from the organization, sorry, shape, color, size, and scent are banished from the sound of the word. Foucault proposes a more complex organization before the 17th century where the sign inheres in the thing itself. Okay, this is, now he's quoting Foucault. At the time, the theory of the sign implied three quite distinct elements. That which was marked, that which did the marking, and that which, was, which made it possible, sorry, and that which made it possible in the first, the mark of the second. And this last element was, of course, resemblance. The sign provided a mark exactly in so far as it was almost the same thing as that which it designated. So he, he talks about a shift which occurred between the first and the second print. The first was seen as an omen um, with the thing inherent in the, in the tree stump and the second um, shown in detail as the mark as itself, as you see in the middle. So um, back to my work. Um, I, I kind of wanted to go on that little detour because I think um, in this installation, it's, it's kind of relevant. So this work um, is the show that I made for the Turner Prize, and I made it out of a number of other things that I already made with, I, I constantly reuse and retitle and reshuffle my works. Um, but this one has a particular kind of um, uh, antagonism to writing and to text. Um, and it's a sculpture of a publishing house. It's called Thames and Hudson. Um, and part of it is to do with kind of making a... <laughs> making um, like a, an image of... an art book or an art, a series of art books as if you completely didn't understand them. Um, and I've made this kind of nonsensical um, text by printing directly from a chair, inking it and making a kind of sentence from it. Um, there's also a lot of other uh, kind of misunderstandings or um, positions that maybe you're not supposed to take. So this is a Henry Moore um, sculpture that I've printed over just a kind of abstract shape that I made. Um, yeah. And then here again is, is Black Alphabet, which obviously has a, a kind of um, resonance with, with text or with writing, but um, again, quite a nonsensical one. And then the, um, the logo of Thames and Hudson is uh, two dolphins or whales um, in a kind of loop with each other. So one of them was the, in this installation, one half of that logo was um, the whale drawing that I showed before in the Leonora installation. The other half was this 
um, behind these slits, there's actually a, a sperm whale um, skeleton. So you just see it in these little kind of zips or little lines. So um, it's almost completely kind of unweighted in the space. It's quite hard to get an impression of it from pictures. But um, yeah, it's almost turning this massive thing into a graphic. Oh yeah, that's the front view that you also see just through a little zip there. Okay, um, I'm gonna go back to um, the show that I made in Yale Union. Um, the kind of, I suppose the basis of the show and the main, um, I suppose like, um, conceptual idea for it was um, print and literally the backbone of the show was these huge blocks of, um, of lithographic stone that I got from Lithograph City which uh, is um, a quarry in Iowa which was um, very briefly a commercial lithography quarry. Um, so before that, lithographic stone came from two places. The main quarry was in Germany. Um, and the stones that basically printed all of anything that was printed before about 1920 um, came from prints from stones. And in the outbreak of the First World War, um, stone stopped being imported to America and probably to Canada as well. Um, and so it had to be sourced locally. Um, and Lithograph City was, was founded as a kind of pop-up town around this quarry. Um, and it printed its own newspaper on its own stone, obviously. It had a a hotel, it had a dance hall, it even had a museum, and it had workers' cottages. Um, but the railroad never came to Lithograph City, um, so they could never really viably export much of their stone. Um, and during the time, yeah, that's, that's a lithographic stone. This one's actually made to put um, transfers on ceramics, which is weird. Um, his Here's the quarry, and that's the seam of lithographic stone. That's the quarry as it is now. Um, but basically, uh, Lithograph City um, became a ghost town shortly after that, probably I think around 1930, it was completely um, vacated and it had been plowed under. And now you can see the foundations of the houses and that's all that there is apart from the quarry. And the quarry is like currently um, used as an aggregate quarry uh, by this guy, Bill Kroll, who is really cool, helped us a lot um, and posed a lot next to rocks. Um, and it's used to, to make concrete. So we went up there and um, chose rocks and he hauled them out for us. And then I cut them and polished them to the best lithographic layer um, and kind of prepared them for printing. Most of them I prepared for printing. Um, and they had to sit in the room in the L Union above the columns so that they were supported. So it actually, like the architecture of the room completely dictated how the show was put together, which was quite nice. And these, these stone works were called American Images. That's how most of the show looked. It's really difficult to photograph it because you can never get quite far enough away. Um, in addition to the 
lithographic stones and boulders. I also made um, a replica of my table, my kitchen table in New York out of the same stone. Um, and I also made these uh, wooden flitches, as they're called, um, which are lying on the floor that I'm going to talk more about later. Um, these on the wall, you see these um, prints, they're made from the front page of the Guardian newspaper. So um, the Guardian newspaper really kindly kept the plates after they'd printed the paper for me. Um, and I just specified a, like a period of time that I wanted them to keep the plates for me. Um, they kept them for two weeks. And during that two weeks, um, obviously I didn't know what was going to happen, but um, it was quite an eventful time in the news. It was uh, the death of Margaret Thatcher, which was obviously a big thing in, in the UK. And there was also the Boston Marathon bombings and the subsequent manhunt that happened after that. Um, I printed the, the plates, removing nearly all of the text from them um, and abstracting a lot of the images. And the way that I did that was um, when the plate gets inked and then it gets offset onto the roller or the blanket. And when it's on the roller, you can actually take um, a rag and just wipe parts of it away and then print from it. So they're kind of monoprints more than they are anything else. Um, but I printed them in this ink that is a kind of terracotta color which matches these terracotta sculptures that are on the floor. And I also made a, a series of colored prints that weren't in the show, but I've got decent pictures of them so you can see them a bit better. And I'm interested in these prints in how they are so precisely dated at the time that, um, that obviously that they're printed um, and the dates are on nearly all of the prints. But I'm also interested in how as artworks they, they mark a particular time and then they recede into the past themselves and the events. It's quite strange if you see them within two or three weeks of these events happening because you, if you, um, look at that paper ever, you, it's completely, like it's so familiar and, and um, you have a almost kind of direct memory of what it was anyway. Um, and then that changes over time obviously. So um, the the flitch that I was talking about before, flitch is a, a weird word that um, refers to uh, slices of wood, slices of halibut, and slices of bacon, and that's it. I don't know why. Um, but yeah, the flitch that was on the floor um, is a kind of wood called sinker mahogany, and it's mahogany that um, that's like old growth mahogany that was harvested in probably the probably around 1870, 1880, in in Belize, that was a British colony at the time, um, and a lot of our kind of antique furniture is made out of this stuff. Um, so much so that it's quite traditionally British. Um, the really densest and heaviest trees um, sank in the river and they're currently being salvaged. So they've basically, they went AWOL for a hundred odd years and now they're being dredged back up. Um, and the wood on the outside is very weathered. It's kind of, a lot of it's turned whitish, um, but the wood has, hasn't rotted, which is quite amazing. It's, it's pretty much preserved. So they're now sold for um, 
joiners and antique furniture repairers and guitar makers. Um, but I got really interested in it as a material because it has, um, it belongs to a different era and it also has this kind of um, missing chunk of, of time itself where it's just lain completely unwitnessed and undisturbed. And for some reason to me that made me feel like I could use it in a more abstract way myself because it already has a very specific story. So these are the boards um, as they get marketed. And this is what I made from them. Um, it was basically at the time that I was leaving my studio in New York and I had packed up the work and I packed up the tools and um, chucked a load of stuff away and then there were all these kind of intermediate things that I didn't want to chuck out because um, they're some are unsold editions, some are prototypes, some are experiments that never went any further. So, um, and some of them are props that I've used in other works. So I inset them all into these flitches that I also had spare that I hadn't used. So I made these kind of strange um, sculptures that are not really abstract because everything is already something else in it. Um, but they're not figurative either. Um, I mean, they're almost like, they're like a kind of um, circuit board or something. So that's a little test for making those um, foolish melted things. And this, um, this is a piece of walnut with inset tiger's eye and carnelian that I used um, in this series of photographs that I took in the Metropolitan Museum where I'm holding them up against the Vuillard painting um, in this kind of uh, extension of the colors and the marks that Vuillard made. Um, so, those flitches that I just showed you became the basis of this show, um, which was at the start of this year. Um, it's basically taking the mahogany flitches as the original. It's a series of copies, and each one is a copy of the one before it. Um, so the first one's mahogany, the second one is ceramics, and then the ceramics are copied in marble, the marble is copied in aluminium, the aluminium is copied in wood again, but it's like a kind of decorative um, series of veneers and fancy woods. Um, and the rules for this project is that it always goes from object to object. It doesn't ever go from object to drawings back to object or from object to photograph back to object, it goes, it's copied first hand by the people who are making it. And they're all made by, most of them are made by different people. Um, I made the first and a little bit of the second, um, and then I stopped. <laughs> um, but it, it's like a, well, we call it a Chinese whispers, but when I tried to put that in the press release in New York, it was like not cool. So I think it's called telephone here. Does that make sense to people? So, um, yeah. There's a whole series of, of translations that get made partly through mistakes and partly through um, the choices that the different makers have made. Um, and some of them are to do with just the practicalities of the material. So, um, the center line of the marble has changed from the ceramic because we couldn't source pieces of marble big enough. So there are all of these um, adaptations and, and translations. And the series itself has got kind of an interesting um, tension between abstraction and representation in it because there's obviously a series of, of um, 
I mean, it is obviously a series of representations of the thing before, but none of them are that recognizable. And when I was making this project, I, I wanted it to be, um, well, I partly wanted it to be a quite archaic process and a quite um, archaic way of translating something. Um, it was just massively inconvenient as well. If you're like working to a deadline, you have to ship an object to France to get made in marble and then back to ship, blah, blah, blah. Um, but it was, it was quite, So this is an ongoing project. Um, here it is with another, it's actually got another three pairs um, in this iteration. And this is one at the moment in Lyon at the, um, at the Gallo-Romain Museum, which is an amazing venue for it because everything else in the, in the museum is kind of much, much more archaic looking. So when I showed these in New York, they looked quite old in some way. Um, here they look brand new. Okay, I think I will leave it there and I'm very happy to take questions if anyone has. As a student, I didn't actually look at that much art, but I did before I got to college a lot. Um, and I think I was more interested in, in like my, my peers, really, and, and what we could do together. So I guess like my inspiring period was, was pre-art school, um, when I used to go around museums all the time, and also the <laughs> the house that I grew up in, I'm making a work about the house that I grew up in at the moment, um, and my father still lives there, but it's basically all of the all of the things that really influenced me were his books and the things he collected and things like that. So I'm now going through all of his stuff and trying to figure out the way of dealing with that now in, in my practice. Um, but anyway, that's a bit another side. Um, the we that comes in is that I work with a big... Um, team of, of different people um, to produce my work and um, and it is uh, they're, they're a really great group of people um, who I rely on quite a lot <laughs> um, so yeah the we comes in from that kind of camaraderie that I have with the people who help me make things Thanks. Um, from the examples of other artists that uh, you're interested in that you showed at the beginning of like Virginia Woolf and the individual subjectivities that she brings with that group of children that introduce the waves and then that painting, there seems to be this s interest in modernist works that have a lot of romantic qualities and I wondered if this type of subjectivity is something that you're interested in. I would say yes. <laughs> it's not very cool, but um, but I think I have to fess up to that. <laughs> uh, okay, <laughs> I'm glad. Um, I think 
Yeah. Um. I think I'm I'm interested in quite extreme kind of points of of subjectivity. Um, like in the Ship of Fools, you also get this idea that all of the fools are sitting in this boat together, but they all have a completely different um, view, incompatible view of of the world. But they're all somehow together in this in this story. Um, and I kind of see a a parallel maybe with Virginia Woolf and in that but hers are not foolish but yeah I'm, I'm quite drawn to subjectivity I think Hi sorry um, I saw your show with the Brancusi birds in London and I was wondering if you could tell me how they were made. <laughs> we just made up the last edition of them, and they shipped a couple of days ago. But um, um, they are a complete nightmare to make. They're made out of um, of coal, which is like um, the bits of coal that are no longer lumps of coal. It's called dross. Um, so. You shovel up all the dross and then you set it with resin in molds, but the resin is catalyzed by um, an alkali reaction and the coal is acid, but it's acid in varying degrees because it's a fossilized <laughs> fuel. Sorry, you're getting the long answer now. Um, and so it's really difficult to get the resin to set. But anyway, if you do manage to get the resin to set, then um, then the outside of the resin is eaten back away with paint with uh, like paint stripper to expose the coal again, so they look like they're coal. Well, they kind of are coal, coal and resin. Okay, and the one that you took the mold of, um, and was that one that was sculpted, or was that an original version of the bird that was? It's sculpted. Sculpted. Yeah. So, um, so I, I think I made them first when I was living in Switzerland, and I got access to take lots and lots of photographs. Um, and the same with the Brancusi newborn. I got, MoMA had one and they let me take lots of photographs and then we made it from from them. I'm sorry, just one more. And what material was the original one you made from? The one that you cast? So you made one and you cast it. Yeah. But the original one was made of what material that you made? Wood. Wood, okay. I'm just curious to know who is generous enough to lend you um, the whale skull. Oh, <laughs> the um, the Museum of Scotland lent it to me, so I made the work the first time round in in Basel, and the Natural History Museum in Basel lent it to me, but it was a different whale. And then the Museum of Scotland lent it to me, but um, I had to coerce them quite a lot. <laughs> they basically said they they sat on the loan request for three months and then they said no like a month before the show, so I had to go and talk to them again. <laughs> and they moved it to London, you said. Yeah, then we moved it to to London and it fit in the lift at Tate Britain. The skull did with about like that much of a spare, so it was really lucky. Because otherwise we'd have to build ramps up the front steps and winch it up. But yeah, it was quite it was quite an undertaking. Thank you. Um, Lucy, this isn't a question, it's um, just for your own um, reference. Did you happen to see um, the sculpture called The Black Canoe at the Vancouver Airport when you flew in? No. Well, because you're a, a collector of ships of fools, I think it might interest you. It was actually produced about a block away from here. 
um, some years ago by the Hyde artist Bill Reed. And it's um, a monumental work originally done in, uh, in clay and then cast in various materials. But it's a, it's a story, a Haida story, which I, I wouldn't um, presume to, to recount here, but it's, it's had a marvelous piece that um, relates this story of all of these different animals um, floating wherever in this magnificent um, war canoe. Reed himself um, is depicted as the sole human occupant, which includes ravens and various other creatures. And he plays the role of the reluctant uh, conscript, I think it is. Anyway, uh, when you return <laughs> to, uh, to the UK, I suggest you take some time to, to check out the sculpture, the black canoe. Great, thank you. It's funny, I've got a, a picture of, um, I was in Vancouver in 1980 when I was five, and I have a picture of my sister who was then two next to his, um, his uh, I guess it's like uh, the clamshell with the people in the raven on top in the Museum of Anthropology. Mm -hmm. And I think that was the year that he completed that sculpture, so mm. I will definitely check it out. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. So at, at the beginning, you were talking about um, the point in time when um, people were thinking the world was, or the universe was 2,000 years old or whatever it was, and then four billion years old. And um, you also seem to be interested in a lot of um, historical uh, narratives, um, but also you like to continue your work in like an evolving kind of way into the future, so my question is, do you, th do you think more about the past or the future more? Hmm. Um, I think I think more about the past, and I'm partly a bad planner, and I pretty much don't know what I'm doing at the time that I'm making it. I mean, I, I, have, the, I have the image of what it is that I want to make, but I... I find um, those works that I've made that are more kind of narrative or sequential are partly in response to um, having to <laughs> be the spokesperson for your own work. And so you find yourself in this position that you have to write the press release or you have to somehow um, bring a narrative to the work. So I thought that I might be able to address it in a more direct way of making the work into a narrative itself, I guess. Great. <laughs> I guess that's it.